the first steps of being part of Call and Care? Well, the first thing you need to do is to identify someone or a core group to coordinate the project locally. Call and Care coordinators will be responsible to the leadership of the community organisation or church for what happens. Once the coordinators are in place, then there is a need to agree the boundaries of what is going to be offered and to whom. It may be best to start with a limited group of volunteers and then to grow it. There is a clear need to agree what is being offered and to progressively work through a list of people to contact. What can be offered will depend considerably on the resources of the church or community group. But our vision is to keep the basic offering very simple. Calling Care aims to meet the human need for social contact offering a voice and someone to talk to. So it simply requires the ability to call, to listen, and to be there for others. In a church context, fellowship and limited pastoral care can also be offered over the telephone. This can be done by anyone with sensitivity and a willingness to work within boundaries. The parameters need to include one, what is on offer and what is not on offer and when to stop. Two, an agreement as to what confidentiality means to the individual and to the team in this context, including safeguarding. Three, accountability and responsibility. Four, support and supervision. Now, Let's look at these one by one. The first, what is and what is not on offer? Call and Care is not designed to be counselling or therapy, but instead it can range from a listening ear and a chance to offload with regard to life to maybe an after church fellowship type of conversation. Volunteers may feel that they have answers solutions and fixes for any problems that might be raised. This should not be on offer. And volunteers need to be aware that they're not expected to do anything beyond listening in a caring way. It is important for the person being called to feel that they matter and for them to be heard, but without there being expectations raised that they are being sent a knight in shining armour coming to rescue them, to fix them, to take control. That is not what we're seeing within call and care. The second, confidentiality and safeguarding. Things will be said which will inevitably include personal information. And sometimes this will go beyond what would normally be shared in a community group or an after church context. The trust and privacy of the person needs to be respected and they need to be confident that the interaction is not going to have a negative effect on them locally. However, there is also a need to ensure all safeguarding standards are upheld and therefore anyone acting on behalf of the community organisation or church needs to be fully aware of the safeguarding expectations and limitations these put on the ability to keep confidences. Volunteers need to be able to bring any safeguarding concerns to the coordinators. Good practice is that confidentiality is to a team with a clearly defined sense of who this includes and also what the safeguarding policies include. Three, accountability and responsibility. It is essential that there is a clear sense of acting on behalf of the community group or church and knowing where you fit in as a volunteer, what you can do and when it is essential to refer to someone else. Whatever a person's background, in the context of listening, every volunteer needs to have the same clear responsibility and accountability. Because different people will come from different professional backgrounds, different trainings, different experiences. 
But in the context of call and care, they are part of one particular scheme. And it needs to be considered and agreed and laid out as to what call and care in your context means. Doing this gives security to those participating and also a safety net to all concerned. No one should be allowed to feel that they are on their own, coping with issues raised, or that they have any responsibility to resolve those issues. They need to know who they can turn to. Additionally, no one should be allowed to carve out a role beyond the intended one to avoid the maverick, the lone ranger. They must not act on their own behalf, which is why it has to be under the supervision and control of the group or church and for there to be accountability and responsibility. Four, support and supervision. Each person needs to know where they can receive support for themselves as they participate in this work so that they're not left holding sensitive or difficult situations. Support structures need to be clear whether they are being offered planned supervision on a regular basis or whether they're going to be allowed to call as and when required. The only thing about that is that if you rely on the person to call you if they think they need it, it relies on them acknowledging a need to contact you. So I would recommend that you create a structure with regular support and supervision. Maybe pre-planned session times in such a way that the coordinators can keep an eye on what is happening. Working within these four parameters that I have just described, a service can be offered to the people needing it where they can feel safe, feel that there is a structure, there is safeguarding and that there is accountability and that their situation and their respect is being protected.